Right, so continuing on, continuing on then with um, our look at source B. So this is uh, question four of paper two. So this is part three of that series of videos for question four. So we left off having looked at the language that's being used in um, question in uh, the Charles Dickens text about the royal crash to convey his ideas and perspectives on the train crash. Now we're going to have a look at source B and compare um, the differences in the ideas and um, the methods, the techniques, the language that this writer uses. So um, I think the last thing I sort of said in the video was that you know the Charles Dickens one is more of a first person account um, of somebody who was actually there conveying the shock and the you know the chaos of the um, event as it unfolded and then this one is um, a newspaper interview with some parents so it's a more of a, of, of, of a woman who was tragically killed in the train crash and so it's more of a third person account this newspaper reporter is presenting um, their sort of views and their ideas of what has happened what has happened and so if we look at the very first paragraph, um, we are introduced here. Uh, here we go. A cacophony of telephones bleeped and buzzed. So it's the telephones of the people, the families, and the loved ones um, of the victims um, who are not at the train crash itself. So we're getting their perspective. This writer is presenting um, the idea of those families and the victims who weren't actually there. And he says, a cacophony of telephones bleeped and buzzed. And so that gives us the sense of it's, it's people from the outside looking in, if you like. And this word cacophony, so it, may, it means um, it's a harsh mixture of sounds. Um, so it sounds unpleasant. So from that, so we're doing that little bit of analysis of this word cacophony of telephones bleeped and buzzed. That sound is unpleasant. And so it immediately um, conveys to us the sense of the um, awful implications for the families, for the implications for the families of the victims. Okay, harsh mixture sounds, the sounds unpleasant, immediately conveys to us a sense of the awful implications for the families. So, you know, you can imagine this, the, the, the train crash has happened and there's all these mobile phones going off of the families and the victims. And it's a cacophony of sounds, it's not a pleasant sound. So it, it just gets across to us the, the, you know, the devastation they must have felt. And then we've got here, their desperation building. So that kind of supports, links back to that point. Um, it's a, and again, it's that third person. So he's talking about their, their desperation. <clears throat> um, and how it was building. You know, the sense of impending doom and disaster. Okay. Building. Okay. Um, and then, you know, continuing on, it's another sort of, you've got the they, so, it, you know, reinforcing again that it's, it's the point of view of the parents and the people who weren't actually at the train crash. Whereas, you know, Dickens was actually there and he was talking about the events as they unfolded. They stared in shock at the plume of smoke rising from the wreckage. And so here we've got kind of a difference because in Charles Dickens's description, we talked about how there was this sense of things happening quickly and that action was taking place. You know, people were madly moving around and wildly behaving, um, stumbling around and staggering. So people were, and he was actually doing things, Charles Dickens, to um, help out with the train crash. But here, um, they stared in shock at the plume. So they're kind of frozen. So when it says stared, so that verb, they stared, verb implies frozen in shock, if you like. So unable, the people on the outside were only able to watch um, 
were only able to watch on. They were unable to act. Whereas in Dickens's account, we get the sense of fast action and sort of the chaos surrounding the train crash. Um, and you've got the imagery of the plume of smoke rising from the wreckage. So it's a kind of sense of powerlessness that the people feel um, have been watching the, the train crash, if you like. So that's my analysis of that sort of line there and that verb stared in particular. I mean, it uses the word shock as well. Okay. So then we move on and we get uh, sort of a, some dialogue from one of the parents and he doesn't get an answer from the mobile phone and it says, at that point my heart sank. So of course here we've got the metaphor. At this point my heart sank. So this again conveys the sadness. <clears throat> and evokes um, a sense of pathos for the families of the victims, particularly this parent. Whereas in the Charles Dickens um, extract, it's more a focus on uh, the events that are actually happening there. And we do feel pathos, but it's more for the, um, the victims themselves in, in that moment. And perhaps for Charles Dickens, who was observing everything that was going on. So that would be my connection. That would be linking back to uh, Source A and the difference in the ideas and perspectives that are coming through there. OK, so I'd you know, analyse this metaphor here and then talk about how that was different in terms of uh, what idea it presents uh, to the reader. Okay, so then down here, ah, so this is, because it's a newspaper article, we would expect to find some more factual language. And in fact, the writer does use some more factual language here. So we've got some factual language. Both drivers were killed, as well as 29 passengers and 400 others were injured. Juliet's body was one of the last to be discovered. She was finally found on the eighth day. So there's a couple of things I can say about this. So in Charles Dickens's one, Dickens uses more description and imagery. To convey the, uh, the horror of what has happened in the train crash. Whereas here, the writer is using more stark factual language and by stark I mean it's very blunt blunt delivery of the facts of the uh, rail crash to convey the you know the um, the deaths that occurred, the deaths and injuries. Okay, so I am actually comparing techniques there, which you can do, and actually it's quite a perceptive thing to be able to do that. Um, but I suppose the difference is, is that because this is the aftermath of the train crash, it's not as in Dickens, it's actually what's happening there and then. And he's talking about the bodies that are lying around and all that kind of stuff. We've got the actual facts of the uh, result of the train crash, if you like, in this part. So the writer is presenting a slightly different viewpoint because it, it, it's he's, he's reporting after the fact. So the writer reports after the crash and so is able to give more, is able to give more factual information in this one so that's you know there's a slight difference in the way that those perspectives um, in the in the ideas of the two texts okay um, and then we get of course we talked about this in question two the outcry 
And this is quite an emotive phrase because he's talking about the public outcry. And this, you know, the emotions kind of evoked here are, are of anger, frustration. If you imagine that word outcry sort of implies those feelings that somebody is feeling, sort of anger and frustration about what has happened. Um, whereas Dickens perhaps is, there's no real sense of anger, he's just really conveying his disbelief, I suppose, um, and his and, and, and conveying the ideas of the, 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 the chaos of what had happened. Um, and then, finally, the passengers gaze out of windows across the snaking railway, lines bordered with, by city shrub. A few talk business into mobile phones, others sip coffees and browse through their newspapers. And this paragraph here, where you've got this phrase that I've highlighted, for me, the writer is trying to suggest that we should, and we do, feel safe on railway journeys. So, you know, we gaze out of windows, we look at the snaking railway. So it's some quite pleasant imagery created in that particular line to suggest that rail travel, you know, as a general rule, we feel it's quite safe and we, we, we you know, we find it quite pleasant to be sitting on planes, sit, uh, trains, sipping our coffee. Um, but he's also suggesting that there is a sense of danger attached to it in the rest of the article. So it's almost like perhaps we shouldn't be feeling that kind of sense of safety and that he's kind of suggesting that even though we're feet sitting there feeling quite safe and secure, that anything could happen any minute. Um, and so how is he creating that kind of feeling of safety and security with this verb gaze? So do some analysis here. This verb suggests um, kind of relaxation, just gazing out of the window, sense of safety, sense of calmness, I suppose. Um, and the, you know, the imagery of the snaking railway. It's a pleasant image. <clears throat> creating a pleasant image metaphor creating a pleasant image of um, train travel but there is an undercurrent of feeling here that disaster could strike at any moment. <clears throat> and that, um, the writer is suggesting that perhaps we shouldn't feel quite so at ease. Um, and this is a bit of a contrast because, yeah, let's change that to Dickens. Yeah, this is a bit of a contrast to Dickens because he, in his account, as I've already said on countless occasions, he's, he's conveying the kind of sense of chaos and uh, the disaster of what's actually happened there. But here we've got this idea that, you know, there is in the future, this writer is presenting the idea that in the future it's something that perhaps we should think about that there isn't it's not always a safe and pleasant thing to go on a train journey you know accidents do happen um, and he's kind of really pointing the finger at uh, um, network rail and saying that they need to you know take take account of that and uh, look closely at the safety of the rail networks so there's that difference in ideas uh, between the two texts. Okay, now, as usual, I've picked out quite a few things. I'm just showing you how to do it. So it may be that you have to pick out less things and you pick out the cleverest things um, in order to write your answer. <laughs>